so the story Okay, um, so the story revolves around a protagonist, Segawa Ushimatsu, a young school teacher who belongs to uh, the so-called Burakumin, which is a historically marginalized and outcast group in Japan. To explain briefly, um, so Burakumin um, had been historically discriminated by the mainstream society, um, mainly because the special jobs they had, you know, some make a, make a living by processing animal skins, Others uh, get paid by cleaning human bodies, though there are tremendous amount of discrimination against Burakumi. You know, one thing they could do is usually to hide their identity because you can't um, judge or you can't um, you know tell who is Burakumi or who who are not based on um, you know people's appearance. And therefore, uh, you know, a lot of Burakumi people chose to hide their identity so that um, they can avoid being discriminated. So when we come to Meiji era, right, although um, the government had declared, right, all Japanese subjects should be treated equal, uh, the discrimination continued, right? Segawa, or protagonist, his father, uh, who is also a Burakumi, right, uh, makes his son swear um, to never reveal his true social status to anyone. And this promise then becomes the central theme of the novel and the source uh, also the source of Ushimatsu's internal conflict. Segawa is, is a, like I said, a school teacher, and he's respected for his ability and character. However, he lives in constant fear that his secret will be discovered. And then he um, meets an old Burakumi person, a writer and a social reformer who um, openly advocates for um, the rights of the Burakumi people, um, who became then uh, Segawa's friends and the mentor. You know, Segawa really admired this, this old guy. Um, you know, he he feels that you know he's free and he's really true to himself. However, um, you know, on the other hand, he himself, you know, cannot do this because on the one hand, he already swore to his father that he won't reveal his true identity, but on the other hand, he also, you know, worried about you know all these consequences once he um you know come out as a Burakumi. But eventually, you know, as the story evolved, um, Saigawa revealed his true identity and then began to fight for the rights of the Burakumi uh, community. And then, um, you know, as you may imagine, right, his, his life then was mirrored in um, all these troubles, right? He lost his job and he lost, you know, many of his friends. Um, and then eventually, right, he heard the, the possibility of rice farming in Texas and declared uh, and decided you know, to migrate to Texas um, as a rice farmer right? um, to, um, to have a new beginning of his life. So this is how you know, this novel ended. Right? Um, though the story itself is a fiction, um, I, um, you know, I, I think it's actually um, reflected you know, the fact that Texas was indeed an ideal migration destination of the Japanese rice farmers uh, in the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, so allow me to share my um, my screen as I uh, will get into the main um, main topic uh, for today. So let me um, So the map here um, is, one of is a map from one of the many uh, migration guides uh, published in Japan during uh, the turn of the 20th century uh, that called for Japanese farmers to migrate to Texas to cultivate rice. In the first decades of 20th century, hundreds of Japanese uh, people migrated to Texas and settled along the Gulf as a rice farmer. Uh, therefore, my topic today is the stories of these Japanese farmers for those of you who are familiar with the story of Asian immigrant taxes, perhaps this topic is not entirely new, but my goal is to uh, place their stories in a much wider context of world history and explain how their stories um, you know, could tell us something new and exciting um, about, Japanese, about Japanese history, um, about American West, um, about American South, as well as uh, the global history uh, in the early 20th century.
At first, um, I would like to provide some context and explain why a Japanese people would migrate to Texas and why they chose to cultivate rice. The, all this started in um, 1902 when uh, the Japanese consul in New York, Uchida Sadatsuchi, uh, embarked an investigation trip to Texas. Since the last two decades of the 20th century, many poor Japanese people considered migration to the US as a solution to their poverty. And for them, the United States was a wealthy and free country where they could easily make ends meet. Most of the Japanese people who um, actually came to the US work as laborers, um, basically to fill the labor vacuum resulted from Chinese exclusion. The year when Uchida um, came, um, you know, um, investigated Texas uh, was the same year when the Chinese Exclusion Act promulgated two decades earlier was made permanent in the US. Like many uh, Japanese diplomats, Uchida worried uh, that the Japanese would soon become a primary target of um, you know, racial exclusion in the US West, uh, just like the Chinese. As a non-Western modern nation, you know, Japan always anxious, you know, try to prove itself to be as civilized uh, as its West, uh, Western counterparts. So having the subject treated racially inferior and excluded from the US would harm this goal. So therefore uh, the Japanese diplomats, um, you know, uh, did everything they could basically to avoid, um, you know, the racial exclusion fall upon the Japanese uh, immigrants. So Uchida came to, um, the, came to Texas basically to explore alternative to American West, uh, uh, more specifically to West Coast for Japanese immigration, where the Japanese would not um, have to deal with racial exclusion. And this was also a time when uh, the elites of Texas wanted to attract rice farmers to cultivate land along the Gulf of Mexico. Becoming the 26th state uh, in the, of the US in 1845, Texas had been a crucial participant in the transcontinental expansion of American agricultural capitalism. Even though livestock husbandry was a state economic engine, Texas quickly became a primary cotton supplier in the country by the turn of the 20th century. Louisiana, um, which is a neighbor state, became the top rice producer in the US in 1889 by attracting rice farmers to work the coastal um, lands among the, uh, along the Gulf of Mexico. And this stimulated Texan government to cultivate rice too in the southern part of the state, an area that shared the coastal line with Louisiana. The completion of Southern Pacific Railroad connecting New Orleans with Los, uh, Los Angeles and running straight through Texas also expedited uh, the agricultural development and the transportation of farm product. The Southern Pacific Railroad Company had obtained a large amount of taxing land along the railway lines. Motivated by profit, it spared no effort to attract agricultural settlers to the Lone Star State who would purchase its land for rice farming. Originally tasked with investigating uh, the condition for cotton cultivation in American South, Uchida was approached actually by leaders of, of agriculture in Texas. They expressed a strong interest in um, attracting Japanese farmers to the state for rice cultivation. And the opportunity of rice farming in Texas coincided with the rising call uh, for rescuing agriculture in Japan. The Meiji government achieved rapid urbanization, industrialization, and the militarization at the expense of agriculture. The sharp increase of land tax had led to a long-term economic depression in the countryside. A lot of small farmers had to sell their land to survive. The outbreak of Sino-Japanese War dealt yet another blow to the countryside in Japan. The war uh, boosted industrial development and lured even more rural people into the cities. The growing urban population and the rising standard of living turned Japan from a rice exporter to a rice importer. From the late 1980s 
rice from Taiwan and then, and then later Korean Peninsula began to flow into the Japanese market. The decline of the owner farmer population and Japan's loss of the self-sufficiency in rice cultivation and rice production received immediate attention from the Japanese policymakers and intellectuals. Many of them warned the nation about the importance of farming and thought to improve the position of agriculture in the national economy. Some concluded that the rural depression and food shortage were natural result of overpopulation in Japanese countryside. And the only remedy was for the, for the nation to expand further by relocating the so-called surplus rural people abroad. The emigration of farmers would kill two birds with one stone. On the one hand, the migration would help to balance Japan's domestic farmland ratio, farmer land ratio, and improve its agricultural productivity. And on the other hand, the emigrants would acquire more land abroad and facilitate uh, the further uh, growth of the Japanese population in the home archipelago. And for this reason, Uchida re reports was widely circulated in Japanese media and soon inspired hundreds of Japanese to migrate to Texas between 1903 and 1908. Unlike most of the Japanese migrants on the West Coast who made a living as laborers, the majority of those in Texas arrived directly as farmers. The farm owners usually purchased sizable land ranging from 200 to 600 acres right after their arrival. Most of these farm owners were uh, social elites back in Japan who consciously um, associated their farm in Texas with their social and political agenda in Japan. And so in this talk, I would like to focus on three of, uh, three of these um, you know, Japanese farmers in Texas, including Yoshimura Daijiro, a merchant, Katayama Sen, a socialist and union leader, and Saibara Seito, a politician and the president of a private university in Japan. Through their stories, I would like to illustrate how the idea and activities of the Japanese rice farmers in Texas were closely tied with the social campaigns in domestic Japan. So allow me to start with uh, Yoshimura Daijiro. He was among the first to answer Uchida's call uh, for uh, you know, farming rice in Texas. He formed the Society for Friends of Overseas Enterprises in Osaka in 1903, aiming to assist Japanese farmers for migration to Texas. Together with other society members, Yoshimura purchased 160 acres of land in League City and established a rice farm there in 1904. Though the farm was bankrupt in the same year, this experience allowed Yoshimura to pen two guidebooks on American migration for Japanese readers that highlighted the promising future for rice farming in Texas. One is titled Rice Farming in Texas, North America, a new source of wealth for the Japanese, published 1903. And the other is titled Experiment on Rice Farming in the State of Texas, published 1905. Uh, you, as you can see, both, um, both book covers actually um, is on the slide. And both books revealed how Yoshimura associated with Texas, uh, associated Texas with his agenda for, uh, for uh, you know, Japanese um, you know, nas uh, national growth uh, in terms of economy um, and um, wealth and power. In response to Japan's loss of self-sufficiency in rice, Yoshimura believed that the migration to Texas would not only provide better opportunities for the farmers who struggled against poverty back in Japan, but also reaffirm the centrality of rice in Japanese national character and the Japanese as the champions of rice farming. As he claimed, and I quote, the courage of Japanese soldiers, the vigor of Japanese rack shawls, and the physical strength of Japanese women were all results of rice eating, end of quote. While the demand for rice keep, was demand for rice kept growing in Texas, he argued that the Caucasian Americans preferred commerce and industry to agriculture. 
the Japanese were welcomed to Texas precisely because they were the world champion in rice farming and in agriculture in general. And the second person I want to talk about is Katayama Sen. So Katayama was um, a renowned leader of uh, Japan's socialism movement in early 20th century. He migrated to the United States in um, 1884 and worked to pay for his own education. Having joined the socialist cause uh, while in the US, he returned to Japan right after the first Sino-Japanese war. He became a central leader of Japan's growing labor movement and had led labor unions and demanded improved working condition and better pay for workers. He believed that all the overpopulation within the Japanese society had partially enabled class-based exploitation. He argued that Japan's rapid growth of population caused inflation and rising unemployment. The shortage of food and the job forced uh, the struggling uh, working class people to accept the jobs with extremely low payment. So he believed that an advocate for overseas migration, oh, sorry. So he be became an advocate for overseas migration as a solution to the poverty of Japanese working class. He initially saw the US West Coast as an ideal destination for the Japanese workers who hoped to escape the class suppression. But then in response to the rise of anti-Japanese campaigns there, Katayama shifted his focus to Texas. He came, he, he came to Houston in 1904 and initially worked as a waiter and a chef in a Japanese restaurant. Then he purchased 160 acres of land, started a farm in Aldan, but quickly failed. He then returned to the restaurant and, and formed a partner with his owner, Okazaki Tsunekichi. With the financial support of Katayama's donor back in Japan, the two built a much larger farm in Live Oak. But after his donor in Japan found that Katayama was still involved in, in socialist activities, he pulled the money back, leading to the bankruptcy of the farm itself. Afterwards, Katayama moved back to Japan and rejoined the labor movement there. After the Soviet Revolution, he became a communist and served as an officer of Communist International in Moscow. He remained in Moscow until his death and was buried in Kremlin. For us to have an idea of his importance in Moscow, um, if you look at uh, the picture on the top, Katayama was, was a man on the left. Um, so the man in the middle was Alexei Rykov, right? who at that time was a premier of Soviet Union. And the person on the right, as most of us can tell, <laughs> Joseph Stalin. So that, um, so that he, he was that important, right? As a, you know, as a communist in a, in a global communist movement at that time. And then um, the picture below is Katayama's tomb, um, um, you know, with his name on it um, in Kremlin Necropolis where a lot of you know, globally renowned uh, communists were buried. And then um, the third person I would like to talk about uh, is Saibara Seito. Saibara was a member of the Japanese Imperial Diet and the president of Doshisha University before moving to the US. Uh, for those of you um, who uh, are not familiar with this, Doshisha University is really one of the best private universities in Japan. Um, it's also founded by, um, by Christian missionaries. Um, so he, you know, before his migration, you know, he was already a, um, you know, um, um, Imperial Diet member um, and a, a, a renowned politician and also a, um, you know, president uh, of a elite private university. And then he, um, you know, came to the U.S. to study theology. Um, during that time, um, he decided um, to establish a farm in Webster in 1903. You know, he was both wealthy and well-educated. And his farm, as a result, became one of the most successful Japanese farms in the state. For that reason, Saibara, and, um, Saibara also saw himself as a torchbearer of the Japanese farmers in Texas. He traveled back and forth between Japan and Texas and encouraged people to join him by migrating to Texas. Saibara's farm also became 
a model farm uh, that um, attracted the attention of the Japanese politicians and the intellectuals. After an investigation of the farm, Masudaira Masanao, a member of a imperial diet, concluded, uh, concluded that unlike the US West Coast, the Japanese migrants in Texas were welcomed by local presidents because of their world-class expertise in rice farming. The Japanese in Texas were treated even better than the European immigrants from Italy and Spain. While the lower class Japanese laborers were targeted by exclusionists on the West Coast, Masudaira believed that the capable and educated Japanese like Saibara would easily gain uh, the American citizenship in Texas. And he expected that as the Japanese farmers in Texas um, modeled after Saibara become the US citizen, it would help the Japanese immigrants in the entire country to gain the right of naturalization. Um, so for those of you probably not familiar with this, um, so um, by the turn of the 20th century, right? So people, when people file for um, US citizenship, right? They usually file through, in, you know, through um, individual states. So that actually created some loopholes um, for, um, you know, um, very few uh, number of Asian immigrants um, to actually gain citizenship. Um, although at that time, the constitution basically banned um, Asians from actually um, become naturalized. Um, I'll come back to uh, Saibara. So seeing rice farming in Texas as a promising model that would bring about a better future for Japanese immigrant to the United States, Japan's Ministry of Foreign Affairs also provided political support to the movement. In 1907, the US and the Japan reached an agreement called the Gentleman's Agreement. Right? Based on that, um, in order to avoid provoking the further anti-Japanese sentiment in the US West Coast, Tokyo basically agreed to voluntarily stop migration of the Japanese labor to the US. However, Gentleman's Agreement still gave a green light to those who um, intended to migrate to Texas as farmers, including both wealthy men like Saibara, who would become owners of big farms, uh, and small owner, as well as small owner farmers who would like to collectively manage a farm by pooling together their fund and labor. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs categorized the latter as collective farmers and managed to negotiate with the United States government for the right to migrate. As a result, the doors of Texas remained open to the Japanese farmer migration, at least in theory, until the promulgation of the Immigration Act of 1924 that eventually banned Japanese immigration completely. And the campaign of Japanese migration to Texas ended quickly. Most of the Japanese farmers went bankrupt due to labor shortage and a sharp drop of price of rice at that time. Only a handful of them, including the farm of Saibara, were able to survive. As the diet member Masudaira expected, Saibara indeed filed an application for the US citizenship in Texas. But his effort proved to be unsuccessful. It's very interesting, right? Sabara filed the application, you know, submitted the application for um, for uh, naturalization to the Texas government, and then um, basically no no answer back, right? Uh, no rejection or no approval. Um, so that's that's how Sabara's application actually ended. Assuming this is a this is a failure, right? Sabara's case was echoed by um, you know the overall failure of the Japanese immigrants' efforts to gain the right of naturalization in the US by the 1920s. Disappointed, Saibara decided to leave the United States and remigrate to Brazil. He entrusted the farm to his son and moved to Sao Paulo to start another farm there in, 1908, uh, in 1918. 10 years later, he moved north to Para, where he was hired by a Japanese migration company to become the director of a Japanese agricultural lab in the Amazon River Basin. Finally, uh, in conclusion, my talk today discussed the context and the meaning of the Japanese rice farms 
um, in Texas from a global and a transnational perspective. And before I end my talk, I also want to uh, share with everyone a, a, a website that I um, have created together by working with two of my students. Um, it is it is called uh, the history of um, history of um, Japanese farmers in Texas. So allow me to um, to uh, to sh to um, let me sh allow me to share the website with you. Let me just stop stop the screen share. Um, So um, this, let me, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna type this in the chat. And also I'll be, um, I'll be sharing, I'll be sharing the screen with all of you. Um, just, um, you know, to help you uh, better navigate. See if I can share it. Okay, here we go. Um, so this website is a is a is a one year long kind of effort um, by by me and my two of my students. Um, it's it's currently housed in um, in Houston Asian American Archive um, on the website of Houston Asian American Archive, um, affiliated with the Chow Center for Asian Studies as Rice. Right. So um, if you type that um, uh, wipe li uh, your li the link, you're going to see this page. This is a front page, excuse me. Um, and then um, we we um, basically presented, um, you know, an overview of um, the history um, and the stories of Texas rice farmers um, uh, from Japan. Um, we 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 um you know create the website based on individual um, families right so if you scroll down to the bottom um you will see um you know uh, we we listed all these families that currently we have you know based on the sources we have um you know we created um you know either one page or multiple pages for each family right? um and and we group the family based on um the counties uh, they are located um and um let me let me explain a little bit more so here you know kishi colony or kishi family is just one of the most extensive um um you know uh, the, the family that we have the, the most extensive sources on so the kishi colony um is basically a mini website itself um you know we have a lot of pages created for uh, the kishi colony um you know including its origin um and it's a evil um, and it's um you know evolution and as well as um you know the um the um, the stories of the individuals inside of the family inside of the family um you know say for example here um you you know we, we have introduction basically give you an overview um um so this is an overview of the kishi family uh, we, we also put the sources here and then um you know we also you know if you um, look at um, you know the other column, right? Taro Kishi is one of the sons, um, you know, in in Kishi family. So we have um, you know created a um, you know a thread for Taro Kishi, and then um, you know we, we have also other peoples um, in um, you know in Kishi family too. Um, so um, you know here we have um, you know some legacy pages. Uh, this, so this is. Um, you know, um, cemetery uh, of the Kishi family. Um, and these are the, um, you know, informations um, of the family members. And the website is not just a, um, you know, story or history. We also have primary sources listed. Say for example, um, you know, here, um, you know, if you look at here, you know, we have email correspondence, uh, you know, between Kishi family members and others. Uh, that basically tell you a little bit more about the family itself. If you have time, you know, feel free to, um, you know, explore. 
Um, so Kishi family is only an example, and right? so we have um, you know other um, you know other families. The Sabara family, you know, Sabara was the one I um, I just mentioned, right? Um, Sabara again, you know, back then he was one of the most successful right farmers, rice farmers um, in, from Japan in Texas. Um, and then um, you know there are there are many others. And we also group the family um, in, in, in other pages by uh, theme, right? So we have the theme of agriculture, we have theme of race relation, we have theme of a uh, role of a woman, we also have a theme of building community. So for example, um, the role of a woman, um, you know, specifically we, um, you know, we, we discuss, um, you know, the woman's role um, in the Japanese communities in, um, in Texas, right? Um, you know, uh, usually, you know, um, we when we think about Asian American history, it's um, you know quite um, you know masculine, right? We usually focus on uh, what men have been doing, right? Um, you know how how you know what a, what a contributions I usually men had done. Um, however, you know um, I you know my me and my student really hope that we can present um, you know some some women's story too, right? So um, you know to give some justice um, to the past uh, in which you know women played you know. Um, very, very important role in building family and building communities. Um, so this is uh, this is the um, the website. Um, again, I'd, I'd love to um, you know answer more questions if you have. Um, but you know uh, we also get good news um, is that um, you know a couple of weeks ago um, this website would just um, you know just win the um, award um, from the Texas Digital Library for the Trailblazer Award um, of this year. Um, it's it's a perfect recognition for uh, the efforts um, um, of me and and two of my students have um, you know have paid um, on, on on making this website. Um, and we we are we are also interested to, to uh, interested in expanding the website. So if you have any um, additional sources about the Japanese um, you know community in in Texas or in Houston in particular, um, please uh, reach out to me. Um, my, um, I'm gonna type my email here too uh, in the in the chat, so that um, you know, um, please um, feel free to reach out to me. Um, you know, I I um, I'd I'd love to um, you know to have more um, information uh, and further expand um, this website. Um, I think there there are definitely a lot of other stories and you know other Japanese American families in Texas that we are we're unaware of. So I'd love to learn more from you. Um, okay, without further ado, uh, this is uh, the end of my talk. Thank, Thank you for listening. You so much. Um, I'm hoping that I've solved the feedback issue, but I apologize if I haven't. But there are a few folks who have thrown some comments and questions, so I'll just go through them. And um, folks, if I ask this question and I don't, if there's something you want to clarify, please feel free to come off mute. Um, so John said, um, did not know that Sabara moved to Brazil and France. I understand his son and grandchildren continued as farmers in Webster. Is that true? Um, yeah, so uh, yes, uh, I don't think he went to France. Um, I didn't mention um, about France, uh, probably because the, the sound issue may be in my computer. Um, so Sabara actually, um, you know, after he spent a, spent years in Brazil, he actually came back to Japan. Um, and then, you know, he, um, he also, at that time, you know, J Japanese empire was expanding too in Asia. He actually traveled to Manchuria. He also went to Taiwan. Um, and also, um, you know, before he died, he actually came to the U.S. He died, I think he died in the U.S., right? In his final days, he, he returned to the U.S. and um, uh, died of his, um, you know, with his family. Um, so yeah, he's a really amazing figure and you know an amazing person um, in, in many ways, um, and, and transnational too. <laughs> and, and I think John, John also asked, did Japanese farmers export their rice uh, or was it sold? I think it's sold primarily in uh, in the U.S. Um, you know, I I I should um, you know all my sources actually um, may, um, um, show that um, you know they they sold rice locally. Um, I think in Japan the situation was different because, like I said in the beginning, um, um, you know, Jap you know, uh, the rice produced in Japanese archipelago um, cannot compete actually with rice in Taiwan and Korea because they were much cheaper. Uh, that's how you know Japan lost its rice sufficiency. 
Um, so I would assume, you know, you know, if you're counting the um, the transportation fees, um, probably um, the rice produced in Texas won't compete, won't be able to compete with, um, you know, rice, um, you know, that's um, transported from the colonies to the Japanese archipelago. Awesome. And Kathleen asked if there are any rice farmers left in Texas. Uh, yes, yes, definitely. Um, there are. Um, uh, I, I think, um, you know, quite, quite, a, quite a few of them actually left. Um, you know, uh, I would say uh, the majority of the farms bankrupt and within a few years, right? Um, but there are a few uh, left. Um, 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 you know, when, when tip they adopted in order to survive is to diversify their crops because the rice was no longer um, profitable, that profitable. So, um, you know, Saibara, for example, his um, farm, um, you know, diversified by cultivating, um, you know, cotton and, and, and vegetables. So I think that helped um, to, to um, you know, to um, maintain and, you know, um, maintain the profit for uh, the farm. Um, but again, you know, it, it has been tough years, right? Um, you know, after, after um, this boom was over, right? Um, I don't think they were able to expand their farm um, because that was not easy. Um, and then John said, I saw a note on the HAA website that tells a story about John Glenn and one of the Sabbath family. Was that the second or third generation? John Glenn, um, I should go back to my notes. Um, um, I'm I'm not quite sure. Um, you know, I, this this name is still new to me. <laughs> you know, wait. Um, John, yeah. we can connect to you in Sydney as well if there's more to yeah. discuss there. Yeah. Let me do more. Yeah, let me do more research. Uh, you do do more research if you're interested. I'd love to look into it. I would also love to know the answer. Any relation to John Glenn? That's interesting. Um, so John also asked, did any labor come from Hawaii to Texas? Yeah, yeah. Um, another another person I wasn't able to mention was um, um, Hoshina Kangichi, right? Hoshina Kangichi was another um, farm owner in Texas. He he was actually um, from Hawaii, right? He he was a Japanese, of course. He um, uh, initially migrated to Hawaii and then later um, came to uh, uh, came to Texas directly from Hawaii to build a farm. Um, in fact, he also moved to Brazil <laughs> after the boom of rice farm uh, rice farming in Texas was over. So um, you'll see these kind of interesting connections too, right? From Hawaii to um, Texas and then to um, to Brazil. Um, so one thing you know we we usually forget about the uh, the Japanese American um, you know uh, Japanese American people um, you know at the turn of twentieth century was that they're all really transnational, um, you know borderless, and they look for opportunities. Um, they look for um, you know um, um, ways to um, to uh, for self fulfillment. All right. Sorry, I'm scrolling too far. All right, the next question. In doing your research, did anything surprise you or did you uncover something that you didn't expect? Yeah, I, I would say the, Bra the Brazil connection really surprised me. Um, you know, as a historian, I find the past, um, it's so amazing because um, it's so complicated and so um, uh, so eye-opening, right? Um, so um, it... You know, history is usually, like I said, you know, I usually tell people history is more uh, interesting than fiction uh, because, um, you know, you, you know, usually the reality is actually more, <laughs> more amazing and, and you know, um, and more astonishing in many ways um, than, than fiction themselves. So um, the, Bra the Brazil connection really amazed me. So, um, so Saibara, therefore, you know, is, is a person I spend a lot of time on, um, you know, uh, the more I actually um, read about his story, the more I, I'm really amazed by his by his life. Well, that's a really great segue. Um, I'm going to go back to some previous questions, but somebody asked a question specifically about Brazil. Did any of the other Japanese Texans follow Sabara to Brazil, and were they successful there? Yeah, I would say, um, uh, say for example, um, uh, Hoshina Kangishi, actually, he he followed Saibara, right? He he went to Brazil too, 
um, he was he was successful, I would say. Um, you know, Brazil. Um, again, they, they are no longer rice farmers, right? Uh, once they moved to Brazil, and there are, um, you know, um, you know, Brazil situation was that Brazil actually called for um, coffee uh, cultivators, right? So um, I think um, Saibara and Hoshina also, you know, once they came to Brazil, they started to cultivate coffee um, as well as the cotton. So these are the two kind of main crops um, that they uh, they cultivate and also manage to uh, to profit from it. Um, um, there are others, right, um, who followed Saibara. They, they are not necessarily um, followers of Saibara, but they uh, they follow the same life path. Right. Uh, so it's, for example, um, Nakata Shigeshi, uh, Wago Jungoro. Uh, so these are the, um, you know, kind of intellectuals of Japanese uh, Americans, right? So they initially uh, came to the U.S. on the West Oh, oops, sorry. Uh, so initially, um, you know, came to the U.S. on the West Coast, um, you know, created newspapers. Um, and then, you know, after they get they get disappointed by, um, you know, this anti-Japanese sentiment in uh, on the West Coast, they moved to Brazil um, and uh, settled down there, right? Um, so they both, the, the two people, right? Nakada, uh, Nakada Shigashi and Wago Jungoro, they created newspapers, right? Because they're intellectual, they're not farmers. So um, yeah, so um, from the stories, we can see this larger kind of a connection, right? Um, um, quite, quite a few actually Japanese immigrants in the US actually came to Brazil and, and you know, helped Japanese help to establish a right, Japanese Brazilian community actually in general. I love that. Um, all right, I'm gonna scoop back a little bit. Um, somebody asked, if you know, how did rice farming start in Arkansas? Seems like there was a large population around Stuttgart, Arkansas, if I said that right at all. Oh, okay. Um, so yeah, this is a, uh, this this is a great question, but it's also beyond or already beyond my knowledge, right? In the U.S., you know, I'm not familiar with the rice cultivation in the U.S., right? But um, um, I, I I think you know rice rice farming is over, usually overlooked in American history. Um, I, I I think that um, you know um, we we should do more research on rice on on, on rice cultivation and and um, you know and 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 farming itself. And um, I I think the starting point for Texas is really Louisiana. Right, um, you know, Texas constantly uh, referred to Louisiana as as kind of its rival or uh, example, right? So um, when Louisiana become the top rice producer in the United States, right, Texas, um, you know, uh, wanted to catch up. So that's how um, the Japanese were invited, right? At that time, you know, um, I, I think the Japanese were also welcomed, right, in in Texas. Um, um, you know, uh, probably nowadays, you know, people think about Texas as a, you know, a, a red, uh, a red state, right? Which um, is profoundly different from California. It seems California is on the on the one end and Texas on the other. However, you know, if you look at the, the beginning of the 20th century, the the situation was at a quite the opposite, right? It was California that um, you know had the most of, uh, you know, um, um, most intense um, anti-Asian, um, you know, campaigns. But Texas um, was actually, um, you know, quite friendly um, to um, Asian immigrants. So that's that's how um, you know the Asians started to um, you know migrate to Texas, um, you know, um, as a alternative to the West Coast. Um, so Donna shared. It's not a question, but just shared. Um, they said, I, I don't know now, but not that many years ago, Texas was the number one rice exporting state in the U.S. Not sure how many of those farmers were Japanese, though, but just an interesting comment. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for the comments. Right. Uh, so I would say, you know, I, I, I call the Japanese farmers as a pioneer because they were among the, the first rice, rice farmers uh, in Texas. Right. Um, you know, it's always hard to be the first. Right. So we should definitely give, um, you know, uh, Japanese Texans this, this credit. Um, uh, frankly, I, I don't think the majority of the rice farmers nowadays are, are Japanese. Um, 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 but but again, you know, uh, we should recognize this, this Lexi. <laughs> right? They are the ones who started this. The history is important, you know. Uh, <laughs> 
hence why the, the Texas Historical Commission focuses on, on preserving it. So that's great. All right, let's see. Um, did any of the Japanese Texan farmers branch out into cattle ranching or other crops that were common in Texas, like cotton? Right. Um, I, I think I think cotton is definitely um, a, 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 a another important crops, right? Uh, that uh, Japanese rice farmers um, actually embraced. Um, but I didn't I didn't have any source about um, livestock live, livestock husbandry. Um, but this is also an interesting question because I, you know I thought about it um, because remember I started this talk with a novel, um, right? Um, so Segawa. He was a Burakumi, right? Um, so he, another reason actually he chose to come to Texas, uh, perhaps was because Texas was famous for livestock husbandry. Because, you know, when you do livestock husbandry, you know, one industry come out of it is, is leather making, right? So leather making was a traditional occupation that the Buraku people had. So they were, the black people were discriminated against precisely because they work on they, they work on any animal skins. Um, so therefore, um, I think um, you know, in addition to rice farming as opportunity, a lot of black at that time um, considered Texas as a ideal um, land for migration. Perhaps because um, you know they saw the opportunities um, you know to work on um, leather making industry. Right, because this is the industry that that they traditionally had um, in Japan, um, and they were discriminated against because of that. Right. However, um, you know, in their imagination, right, you know, U.S. is a free country. Right. There, there wouldn't be any discrimination against them simply because of occupation. So that's why I think you know, um, among the Buraku people, Texas become popular. Um, you know, for that reason. Um, you know, but I'll come back to your question, you know, whether uh, the Japanese farmers uh, actually embrace livestock um, cattle ranching, um, I'm not sure, probably not, because I would, you know, I, um, you know, I, I, you know, one reason why they were not was because um, um, the Japanese, um, they're good at farming, right? The vast majority of the population uh, in Japan were actually, um, you know, farmers uh, or peasants. Right. So, um, you know, in terms of their skill, right, they, their skill is really to work on the land, um, not, uh, not to, um, you know, raise livestock uh, as many of the Americans could do at that time. Mm -hmm. Got a lot of really, really cool questions. So um, the next question is, what led you to study Japanese rice farmers in Texas? How'd you get oh, here? <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, that's um, that's a good question. Um, um, I, I'm I'm always interested in um, Japanese the history of Japanese, Japanese migration to the U.S. Right, that's how I you know um, my that's what my dissertation is about. You know, right, the history of Japanese migration in the U.S. and and the, their transnational connection with Japan. Um, um, but I you know that's 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 how you know being a historian is so. Fulfilling, you know, I ran into sources right on on, on rice farming um, in Texas, and then it reminded me about the novel I read, right? The novel I shared with you, right? Um, so when I read the novel in the beginning, you know, I didn't really, um, you know, know that there's a history of actual Japanese rice farming in Texas. I only know that this is a kind of a liberating and the fictional end of this 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 depressing story. But then, um, you know, the the I, I find the sources about Katayama Sen, about a Saibara, and realize, oh, actually, there is a story of Japanese rice farming, right? So um, again, to answer your question, it's the source that actually lead me to this topic, right? And usually, I, I think that this is also thing, uh, a, a amazing thing about Texas, right? When people think about Asian American story, again, it's usually a very um, West Coast centered story. Right um, about racial exclusion, about um, you know ab about um, uh, civil rights movement, um, you know about liberation, etc. But almost every story about Asian Americans are located in tech, uh, in in California or or the West Coast in general, right? Um, you know even you you ask some of the Asian American scholars, you know uh, they probably um, you know couldn't really tell you something about Texas, right? So I think Texas as a state 
or American South in general has been actually left out, you know, in the larger picture of uh, Asian American history. Um, so that's why, you know, I think, you know, my, my work can also, um, you know, um, 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 in reach or understanding of, of the, um, you know, Asian American experience by looking at Texas, by looking at um, um, American South in general. Um, I think Texas, um, you know, the history of Texas has been so amazing, right? Um, you know, although the contemporary, you know, we have really kind of a, um, um, uh, really stereotype image of Texas, but actually Texas um, has such amazing and, and, and complicated past, right? I, I think everybody should, uh, you know, look into. That's why, you know, I really appreciate, you know, friends of, um, you know, um, Texas uh, historical missions, um, you know, uh, um, activities, right? Um, and events that allow us to know more, to learn more about Texas in the past. And um, John shared a cool story. Several years ago, the Japanese American Citizen League and others spearheaded an effort to change the name of the road in the Webster area that was called Jap Road. That was... um, yeah, so I am aware of this uh, this story, right? Um, yeah, I, I um I, I've heard there's a controversy. There's a, there there's a controversy too, right? Um, you know some of the um uh, um. Right, I, I think it's really, um, you know, interesting phenomenon, right? On the one hand, we have, um, you know, people, civil rights, um, you know, people calling to um, to change the name, um, but there are other um, people, even including some of the Japanese Americans who actually oppose to, to change the uh, road name because this is, um, you know, uh, this is the name that actually they, they call the road, <laughs> you know, for, for decades. Right. Um, so, um, yeah, uh, that's the, you know, that's a story that told us, you know, how past it can be complicated. Right. Um, um, I, I think that the Jap Road was where um, another amazing Japanese American family was located. It's called a Mayumi, uh, Mayumi, um, I forgot the given name, but Mayumi Farm. Um, Mayumi was, um, you know, he's an amazing um, young man. Um, he came to he came to Texas and built a farm, um, but he he actually lost his life, um, um, you know, when he he was working um, on the farm. You know, I, I think he lost it because of uh, the malfunction of the um, farming machine, right? So um, you know he sacrificed his life, um, you know, on this land. So it's a sad story. Um. Someone asked, did the Japanese farmers primarily cultivate Japanese varieties of rice in Texas, develop new varieties, or cultivate other varieties of rice? Yes, um, I, I think they um, they experimented um, a variety of uh, rice because, you know, um, if you're familiar with agriculture, you know, I, I think the, you know, uh, the crops really uh, has to be adjusted to uh, local land, local water. So uh, I think the Japanese um um, the Japanese farmers, you know, did a lot of um, experimentations on um, on kind of you know back uh, you know on, on rice on rice um, on on rice types. Um, a famous story is called blue rose, uh, right? The blue rose is a new type of crops um, that um, I think the Japanese um, rice farmers actually involved in cultivating here in Texas. Um, Donna asked, have you ever worked or consulted with the Rice Council? Um, and right maybe Council. with Rice University. Donna, feel free to come off mute if there's some clarification. Yeah, I, I would appreciate a, a clarification. So uh, I, I, you know, what trade organization, the trade organization for the rice industry. Oh, uh, I I wasn't. <laughs> uh, I'm I'm a historian, so I'm not an expert in agriculture. <laughs> Well, um, they would they would might be able to provide some background on the rice industry in Texas in general. Oh great, cool. <laughs> um yeah, I I I'd, I'd love to share what I know um with them. And vice versa. Yeah, and, thank you Donna. I just assumed that meant from Rice University, so I'm glad I'm glad Donna shared that. Um and then John has just shared that he is very interested to know um other topics regarding um Japanese history that you've researched. Um, if you would like to share any here or, you know, you guys are welcome to connect, of course, outside of 
that as well. Um, yeah, you know, another, I'm, I just completed my, my second book, which is on a history of Japanese migration to Brazil. So uh, the book will be um, officially published next year um, in the spring. So um, it can be an open, uh, open access. So um, uh, you can simply download it and, and, and read it uh, from University of California Press. Um, and, um, um, you know, uh, John, thank you again for the question. So if you're uh, interested, you know, uh, please, um, uh, you know, come to Rice and take my class. Uh, you know, I, I teach, uh, um, I teach uh, a Glasscock um, in school's um, um, course, you know, basically it's a public facing course, um, you know, in this fall, I think. Um, also in the spring, right? So uh, basically you don't have to be a right student to take the course. I teach modern Japan. Uh, it's a short term, uh, like six week long, um, you know, course about about Japanese history. Um, so yeah, um, I'm, I'm so proud of um, the course myself because, uh, you know, I'm trained as a Japan expert, right? So I um, have been teaching modern Japanese history for over 10 years already. So, um, you know, I each year I update my, my, syllab my syllabus um, and enrich my knowledge on modern Japan too, right? Um, so the more I, I, I read, the more I, I learn, you know, the more I'm excited about modern Japan. Uh, you have asked, where can we learn more about the course? Um, and just to clarify, of course, please share here, but I am I will be sure to share all of this in that email with everybody that registered. So don't feel like you have to memorize things now. I'll be sure to share the resources. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so um, maybe I can also um, share um, share share a page. Um, so this is a this is a this is a my um, my the course the course link uh, um, on on rice um, on rice website. Um, so I hopefully I'm I'll be I'll be teaching this course again um, in the coming spring. Um, so uh, if you're very interested, please do register. <laughs> yeah, thank you for sharing that. And again, uh, yeah, I, I, again, I, I'd like to uh, encourage everyone. So if you know more about um, Japanese Japanese um, people, Japanese immigrant stories here in Texas and, and in Houston, uh, please definitely uh, reach out to me. Um, I'm always interested to expand my um, my web my, the website I created. Um, and then also, um, I, I want to type an, another um, another. Um, I give you another um, website. Um, so, so this is a Houston Asian American Archive. Um, so this is an archive that is also associated with uh, the Chow Center for Asian Studies. Uh, that I'm um, I'm a faculty consultant of the um, Houston Asian American Archive. So this art in this for this archive, we interview Asian Americans. Right. Um, if you if you're Asian American or you're um, you're connected with, with any Asian Americans, um, please you know if you are interested to be interviewed, um, please re reach out um, either to me or to um, you know to to Ha to the or staff members in um, in the Asian American Archive. So um, we we interview people, we record their story, their life stories. Um, we uh, we have been. Actually, um, recording this for years, um, um, there's a lot of. Um, um, we have. If you go to the, um, if I can share with you, um, let me just share with you this, really quick. Um, how can I? Let me just. Here, uh, which one? <laughs> okay, probably this one. Um, so this is this is the um, the Haas website. Um, so if you go to the menu, um, you go to the collections, um, and you click the interviews. Um, you will see, um, you know, we, we already uh, interviewed hundreds of people, I believe. Um, um, I, I saw somebody type in the chat, uh, where's, where's Lou, sorry. Uh, my story is actually in the, um, you know, uh, I, I was interviewed too. 
right? So it's it probably gonna take some time for my story to uh, to um, to be to appear in the website. But um, uh, but again, um, if you're interested, um, please um, please um, you know participate and 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 let us know, right? I think the amazing thing about Ha, you know, is is really to um, to to let people to tell their story in their own voice. I think it's a really unique, um, you know, among uh, among many Asian American uh, historical archives, um, you know, in the nation. You know, Hai so far is the only one that I know that is dedicated um, to uh, interviewing people. Um, you know, um, or center has you know spent a tremendous amount of efforts and and time, um, you know, to to do this, right? Um, so um, I hope you can contribute and um, help us to um, to further expand um, or or archive and collection. Well, I I love that you were able to answer that last question. Hopefully, I'll have to go on the website once it's been uploaded. Um, it seems like the questions have kind of slowed, but again, y'all, I will um, or Christy maybe will send the email tomorrow with. Um, all of these links, Dr. Lee's email, um, a link to the recording. Um, as always, we really appreciate uh, everybody logging onto these events and just supporting it. We're so excited to continue sharing all of these uh, these cool presentations with y'all. Dr. Lu, thank you so much. This was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, again, um, for uh, for listening and for all these great questions. You know, as a historian who you know who dedicated himself on on this topic, you know nothing can be more fulfilling to have um, so many people to join me and you know to um, to listen to this story and and to share the passion with me and 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 contribute your questions. Thank you again. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a fantastic evening and keep an eye out for an email from us very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Bye, good night.